Um, there's a, there's a, I've heard this quote I don't know how many times. There's a recent quote. It's come into popularity the last few decades. Starts, it goes, and it's wrongly attributed, by the way, to Einstein. Uh, the, it, Einstein did not say this. However, a lady named Jessie Potter said an equivalent in 1981 in Tennessee at a, uh, an AA women's conference. And almost everything can be attributed to her or to a novelist named Rita Mae Brown. But uh, the, the quote goes something like this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Okay? Her quote actually, uh, Jesse Potter's was, uh, if, you, if you continue to do the same thing, you can expect the same results. And it got later put into a, a, an AA conference dialogue as uh, insanity is doing, making the same mistakes and expecting different results. But the reason I looked that up, it, it didn't sound like Einstein. First off, he spoke in German. But uh, the other thing is that doing the same thing and, exp and looking for variations in the results is the foundation of empirical scientific method. Right? If you've ever taken a science course, that's what you're looking to do. Have you ever done, a number of people actually here are scientists. But it, science does that. It does the same thing, tries to control the variables, put the same situation in order, give the same sorts of stimuli or the same sorts of conditions, and then look and see if there's variations. It's doing the same thing and looking for different results. That's the point. This, we can either make the conclusion that the quote is somewhat invalid or that scientists are all insane. Um, <laughs> I leave you to that. I'm not going to touch that one, but that's, in other words, what the method does is it checks to see if the same results occur by repeating, right? You do the same thing and see if you achieve the same outcome. That's the point of science. You do the thing, you see if it comes out the same, you do it again, see if it comes out the same, see if there's variation between it. Because we're trying to see if, I say this as a social scientist, because human beings are completely uh, unpredictable. But uh, yeah, there's no way. We're, like, we're going to make you grow up again, see if you answer the question the same way. OK, that's not going to work. But uh, we're a soft science. So, but what you're trying to figure out is if it ends up being the same thing. Because we're trying to figure out if our actions or the, the, the behaviors, the influences that we're trying to exert, actually make a difference or if it's going to turn out the same way no matter what. That's kind of the point. We're trying to check if and we're trying to check what and we're trying to see by doing so really what kind of role we have in the universe and how whether or not we really can manipulate it which we can't. Often. Think about a, a lottery winner. How many lottery winners give the Account. Well, I always come down to the same, down to the liquor store, right? I always come to, those are people that I buy our, always down to that same store, and I always play the same numbers. And then one day I won. Comes out different sometimes. Because the influences are beyond the scenario. We're trying to figure out exactly how those all put together, because it's a basic drive of human consciousness of existence to try to figure out, make connections between our experiences and causality. Try to see what makes what do what in the world and see where we are in, in relation to that. Anybody here ever tried to raise a three-year-old? Good. Or a toddler, right? If you got a toddler, toddler, put, here's the high chair. I'm going to let you finish the story. Here's the high chair. Here's the infant. Here's the, that strange little tray that never fits on rightly. Here's the oatmeal. What happens next? Huh? What happens next? Oatmeal. Yeah, it goes like this. No, honey, don't do that. Oatmeal's for your mouth. <laughs> I 
No matter what you put in front of that child, goldfish. You could put it. It's going to go over here, and it's going to go to the floor because the child is testing to see, will it ever go that way? Right? That's what, the, literally, the child is checking the consistency of the universe to see, will it go that way? If I do this with the young male, yep, went that way again. See, children are empiricists. They are also insane. The child is also, and here's the beauty of the child. The child is also detesting to see, will mom always react that way? Will dad come over and say something to me if I keep dropping it when they say no? What does the word no mean? They're figuring out all those things at once. And we try to, we try to interact with them. We've, we try to figure those things out, and we try to get kids to figure those things out. You ever had a conversation with that three-year-old you're trying to raise? How's the conversation go? That conversation proceeds something like this. What? You start it. Huh? Oh, good. You started with the first word because they don't even bother to have a topic. I've charted for you the basic conversation of an adult with a child. This is the script for the child. Let me start here. All right. We got that up here. First, they start with a blank. This is called tabula rasa. Uh, there we go. It proceeds to this. And, 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 this is where it ends. Because for every, everything you say, the child says, wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. And you say, well, because, and then the child says, well, wow. Uh, no, you can't have a cookie. Wow. Because you, you've already had enough sugar. Why? Well, you know, there are limits. You have a pancreas, after all. <laughs> and I know it converts it to running, but, uh, but why? Well, that's the way that you don't... Know, you can explain the entire, like, all of the physiology of a human being, and they're still going to be saying, wow, because every why has a because, and then the because has a why beyond that, and all of those whys are interactive. Daddy, why are we moving? Well, because we have to buy another house. Well, why, why do we have to buy another house? Well, because Daddy doesn't make enough money. Well, uh... What, well, why doesn't daddy make enough money? Well, because uh, daddy, uh, well, daddy doesn't know how to handle credit cards. Uh, well, why doesn't daddy know how to handle credit cards? Because daddy was raised in a cons consumer society with far too many commercials that told him false narratives. <laughs> okay? And it just keeps going. Well, why? Well, because in the 12th century, the Medici started a bank in Italy, okay? It's the foundation of capitalism. Why? Because the Medici's were greedy, right? And it just keeps going and going and going. And the why's on why's on why's. And every time you answer a because, there's another why. Now, we're going to get to a little bit more of this later, but I just want to pause for a moment. If... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You don't get any goldfish today. Yeah, you're going in time out, and you're going to have to take a nap till Friday. Uh, <laughs> why? Because <laughs> I love you. That, by the way, that's awesome, those interactions. So, um, but I do want to pause. If you note, this is on a serious note, the things that you cannot get past in life, the things that always trip you up, that are too hard, that, that gnaw at you, that sit inside of your soul and fester, if you peel them back very frequently, you will find at the very bottom of them a throbbing why. And that why sits there because human beings 
have more questions than we have the capacity to understand answers. We can't grasp the whys very well. And so we end up in a whole world of small whys, little whys, that crowd us and they, they peck us to death like a flock of blackbirds. And they trap us like brambles. And we can't explain them. Why? Today we're going to deal a little bit with a, uh, a, the story of a guy who had every reason to ask why. And there are a lot of whys around his story. We, tr we dealt a little bit with his story a, a few weeks ago when we were in the, the Bible Unknown series and we looked at Potiphar. But this guy has every reason to wonder why. And there are so many competing reasons and causes and effects and people messing in this story. We can't deal with it. I was laughing at Tony last week. I was like, ha, 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 you got Abraham. You had to deal with the, like 10 chapters of Genesis. How are you going to put that in a sermon? And I, I turn, it looks up, it turns it for me, and I, I've got Joseph, which is 15 chapters. You know, we can't even read through 15 chapters in the time we have for service. So we're just going to crunch the story. But the, how many of you are familiar with Joseph? Good. All right, that's interesting because he's been dead for a long time. Um, <laughs> but you're we're familiar with the story of Joseph. A couple of things just to remember as we go into the story. One of the points that we overlook at the very, uh, in Genesis 35, 22, it says that Reuben, the firstborn, of, see, Joseph is Jacob's son, right? And there's, there's a whole bunch of brothers from two different, well, actually four different uh, ladies, and they're all competing in the tribe. But the firstborn is Reuben. Now, in 35:22, Genesis 35:22, Reuben does a very, very dicey thing. Anybody know what that is? He sleeps with his father's concubine, Bilhah. Okay, that is bad. That's really, really bad, especially in the Middle East in a tribal thing. Mosaic law, thankfully Moses is quite a bit after this. Mosaic law, that's something you die for. Okay. By doing so, and, and there's hints of this in Jacob's last words to his sons, in which he says, Reuben is my firstborn, the son of my strength. He excels in rank. And he goes on to say, but you shall excel no more. When Reuben sleeps with his dad's concubine, it gives Jacob every right to nullify his claim as firstborn. It's like committing a felony and you lose your rights. At that point, Jacob is free to get, he's not bound by the obligations of a father to a firstborn. And everybody knows that there is one son that he really loves. And who is that? Joseph. We know that not only because he treats Joseph like the baby all the time and just loves him and showers all the goodies on him, but they, he gives him this, it's, it's, uh, it's not a robe of many colors. It's, it's a coat, it's called ketonet pasim, which is uh, like an ornamented tunic or a special tunic of some sort, perhaps one that, that simply had long sleeves. Uh, there's, some re there's some relief drawings of those in Egypt, actually, of people from the, uh, the area of Canaan that had those, these long-sleeved tunics. And uh, so he walks around. He's got this uniform of dad loves me the most. It's like, I, I don't want to say this, but picture. Here's your, this is what it was when I was a kid. Here's your, you know, husky jeans. Here's your, at that time, Lee. Here's, and you get Levi. You know, here's, here's your Payless shoes, and you get the brand new Nikes or the Retro Air Jordans. And he's just strutting around in this thing all the time, driving his brothers crazy, enough to where it says when, it, when his brothers saw that, they, that Jacob loved Joseph more than them, they hated him and couldn't speak a word of shalom to him or a word of peace. So you got the favorite who very well might end up being treated as the firstborn because Reuben is out if Jacob wants him to be out. 
and he's strutting around, and he's got this attitude. So he says, hey, you know, I, I had a dream last night. I had this dream, you know, it was a dream. We were out there in the field. We were cutting, we were harvesting, and all of your sheaves bowed down to mine. I just love these dreams. And a little bit later, he goes, yeah, you know what? I had another dream. I had this dream, and the sun, moon, and there's these 12 stars, or actually 11 stars, rather, 11 stars, and I wonder who those could be. One of them looked like you, Simeon, and they all bowed down to me. So how are you guys doing? How was your night? <laughs> so Joseph is always rubbing their noses in the fact that he's the favorite, and he keeps giving them these divine signs that he's their superior. And they are not stoked. And eventually they catch him one day. They go, yeah, we'll see what this dream or what comes of this. And as most of us know, they sell him into slavery, into Egypt. There he has, uh, he starts to kind of do well in Potiphar's house until Potiphar's wife takes a hankering to him and does like a hashtag me too thing on him. Really bad. And she keeps trying day after day. She's trying the same thing and coming up with a different uh, coming with the same outcome. And uh, finally, she changes that scenario and frames him. He goes to prison, meets a couple guys there, the, the butler, the baker, the candlestick maker. Was, that one was on Oahu. Uh, so he, he, he meets them. He interprets dreams for them. One of them gets his head cut off. One of them gets restored. Eventually, Pharaoh has a dream, and the butler says, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot about this friend of mine in prison, and uh, he can help you. Because Pharaoh sees this dream of uh, seven fat cat, uh, cows coming up out of the, the Nile River, and then seven really, it's like corrupt is the word, corrupted, diseased, nasty cows come up and eat them. Like, I wonder what that means. Then uh, he has the same dream about seven ears of corn, Nice, good ones, and then seven bad ears of corn eat them. And when Joseph interprets the dream, he says, God's telling Pharaoh exactly what he's going to do. Now, we pause here for a moment just to say, you realize that God is telling Pharaoh, nothing you do is going to change this. You are not going to be able to affect this. These seven years will be plenteous. You cannot mess with the experiment no matter what kind of an empiricist you are. Everything you do is not going to change it. The seven years that come after are going to be so bad, you've, everybody forgets everything, and you're all going to starve to death unless you do something because there's nothing you're going to do to change this. This is how the universe will work for the next 14 years. Period. And Joseph, uh, Joseph says, so you better become like a prepper. You need to get a bunker and some dried, you know, freeze-dried food because it's going to be bad, bad. And that's what happens. Land of Egypt stores up the food. Joseph's in charge of this. Eventually, the, uh, the famine does come, and the famine hits the family in Canaan. And the brothers go down to Egypt where Joseph has been made prime minister, well, more like a minister of agriculture with special powers. So he's there, and we'll pick up the story, actually. Let's pick up the story. Chapter 42 of Genesis. So they come down and they want to buy grain. And he gives them the hardest time because they don't recognize him. He's shaven for one thing. He looks like a, an Egyptian official. And he keeps saying to them, you're spies. You're spies. Maragalimatem. You are spies. It's just as I say, you're spies. That's what you're doing. You're coming to look for the nakedness of the land. Why is he doing this? Come on. Why is he doing this? Revenge? How many of you vote for revenge? This is like, uh, uh, what is that? Family feud. Revenge. How many, how many votes? Revenge. Ding. Yes, definitely revenge. You can tell, but he's working them. He's holding their feet to the coals for sure. What else? To see if his brothers have changed. Not to see if his brothers have changed, right? Yeah. Change? Uh, sorry, right. Good. Okay. Yes, to see if his brothers have changed. How many of you have vote for to see if his brothers have changed? Right? Ding! 
thing? Yes, six answers. That's true too. The, the text definitely supports that understanding. What else? Why is he working them? He wants to find out about his kid brother and his dad. Remember, he's the older brother favored. They hated him enough to sell him into slavery. He's got one kid brother behind, and he, that kid brother is at, his, at their mercy with him out of the way. And he doesn't know what's happened to his dad. Remember, he and his dad were really close. So if dad's out of the way, if dad is gone, these brothers own the tribe. And Lord help Benjamin if that's the case. So he wants to find out what the state is. That's why he says, okay, I'm going to keep 10 of you. I'm going to keep you guys, actually nine of you. One of you can go home, but you've got to bring the brother. You bring the brother here. That's what's going to happen. That's when we know everything's okay. Is your dad alive? He keeps saying, is your dad alive? Tell me about the old man. Is he alive? Your spies, you better tell me the truth. Because he knows he can't get the truth out of them. Because they're lying, thieving slimes who are so low that they would sell their own brother into slavery. And he wants the truth about how his brother's doing and about how dad's doing. And he can't get it, and he's not convinced. So he goes, okay, I'm going to tell you what. You, well, I'm going to keep you all in prison. He puts him in prison for three days. And he says, I'll send one of you back. You go get the, the, the other one, and you bring him back. That's the way I'll know that this is the truth. And he goes, no, 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 I fear God. I'm going to keep one of you and send But he's keeping somebody hostage because he doesn't want to lose this moment. For them to disappear. They do go back, interestingly enough, as soon as they tell Jacob, he goes, why did you do this to me to tell them, tell the man that you have another brother? And they're like, he interrogated us. And the conversation just dies because Jacob will not send Benjamin. He says, no, you've robbed me. Because see, when Joseph asked them, what about, do you have any brothers? You know what they say? Well, we, we had a brother, but he's just no more. He's just no more. He isn't. And then there's a little one. And he can't get a straight answer. So eventually, they do come back, and he takes them to a, he has a feast for them, and tries again to get the truth out of them. Can't get the truth out of them. And he sends them away, but he tells the steward, stash that cup in that kid's bag, and then go accuse them of being thieves. He accuses them of being thieves. They come back. He goes, okay, well, I'm going to keep this guy as my slave, Benjamin. Why? What? Because keep him there. He's going to keep Benjamin with himself. He can, let him, he can let Benjamin know later and send them off to go deal with the sheep in Canaan. He's going to keep Benjamin until Judah makes this amazing speech. And we're going to pick up there. Chapter, let's see, 44. Verse, let's see. Let's start. Actually, I'll give you a little bit. What Judah says is, he says, my dad's life is bound up in the life of the boy. I promised my dad that I would bring him back. And my dad's life is bound up in the life of the boy. And if I go back without him, he's, gonna, he's going to he's gonna die. And I'm going to bring my dad's life down to the, gra down to the, the, the grave in sorrow. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to do that. And then we hear this speech from Judah that's, Look at verse 33. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain as a slave to my Lord in place of the boy. There's a switch of fortune, isn't it? He goes, let me be a slave, not him be a slave. And let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? Another poignant line. I fear to see the suffering. 
that would come upon my father. See, they had been viewing the suffering of their dad for years because he said, I will die mourning over Joseph, and he didn't ever put off his mourning. He's like, I cannot bear to see my dad suffer like that again. I'll be the slave this time. Which is a complete reversal for how they, from how they treated Joseph. And this is the part I want to get to. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. Think about all that went into this weeping, the years of injustice, the frustration, not being able to know, not knowing what's up with his family, all of that stuff, the wise on wise on wise. Why was I sold? Why did they do that to me? Why can't I go back to my dad? Why can't I, why can't I figure out what's happening to my brothers? When the brothers came, you know, interestingly enough, we didn't cover this. When the brothers come for the first time, they say, we know that this is happening because it's blood guilt on us. They're trying to explain why things are so bad. All of the whys, and it just all comes out as weeping. He doesn't, he's just torn up. So loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Because he can't get the answer. He can't get the truth. And he wants to know. He's like, is my dad still alive? All that frustration. But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. And boy, are you going to get it now. And don't you feel ashamed of yourself now. And now who's going to see about whose dreams? And I hope you remember what you did. Is that what he says? No. Look at this line. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Man. When is the last time we offered forgiveness with that agenda? Because, you know, we kind of we offer the minimum forgiveness. You know, i got to forgive you because Jesus says i got to forgive you. Otherwise, he'll remember my sins. So, um, okay, I'm, remem- I'm, I'm forgiving you formally. You are now forgiven, and you are my brother, but you're not my friend. Or, yes, honey, I forgive you. I want us to stay married. But, boy, are you ever going to hear the chill in my voice for the rest of our lives? And I want you to burn underneath with the whys of this. See, we forgive like the minimum. Joseph's agenda is, I, do not be angry or distressed with yourselves. Rather than, you're going into relational, uh, recon- you know, like, restoration period for about two years until we can make up for this. Do not be angry or dismayed at yourselves. For God sent me before you, God sent me before you to preserve life. Doesn't, does he forget like them going, how much you give me for the boy? Uh-uh, more than that. God, you, you better start with 35. Uh, 32. Or how they bound him up. Or his cries. Don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. They did have a hand in it, didn't they? Wasn't it jealousy? Wasn't it vengeance on their part? Wasn't it Joseph's arrogance? Wasn't it the greed of the Ishmaelites? Wasn't it the the institution of slavery in Egypt and the slave trade? Weren't all of these causes, weren't these the whys and because of how it got sold? Isn't it traditions in the, ancient, the cruel ancient Near East? Yes. 
But Joseph says, that's, those are little whys. There's a big why in the center of this thing that says, God sent me before you to preserve life. And the famine has been in the land these two years. And it will, it's going to last five more years. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And that big Y in the center comes down crashing through and eats all the other little Ys. And it shows the strength and power and breadth of God's hand because Joseph says, I know that there are other reasons. I know that there is sin involved with this. I know that we have had our times. I know that there is a relational issue here. I know that our family system is really, really messed up. But God is in the middle of it. God is doing something with it, and God wants to save you, and he wants to save me, even though it cost me all my dreams. Yeah, he's a high-ranking pharaonic official, but I got an Egyptian wife. I got Egyptian kids. I miss the smell of the, of the landscape in the morning in Canaan. I miss my family. You know he would have walked away if he could. And everything he'd hoped to be is gone. He's never going to be with his peaceful little tribe hanging out in Canaan anymore. I wonder if he took off the gold bracelets and wiped the ochre. You know, it says in one of the passages that he came home in the middle of the day. He came home from work to meet with them. It's one of the real parts of this story. He's a bureaucrat in Egypt. <laughs> But God sent me. Later on in chapter 50, he says, What you intended for evil, God intended for good. What's the point? God has a plan. God has a plan that includes all of the whys that you can't answer and that I can't answer. All the whys and the because that I have no idea. I have no idea why that happens. It makes no sense. It might be unjust. God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. That's the whole point of this mile marker series. God has a plan. He had a plan before creation. His mission exists before creation. And his plan goes on after creation. After time, God has a plan, and it's so big that he can't explain it without making a universe and running it for billions of years. That's the answer, because that's how it articulates. But that plan includes you, and it includes me, and it includes so many whys and because that we cannot grasp, and we're still the three-year-old going, why, 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 why? And that's not just tantrum. It's the pain of ignorance that we really can't grasp why. And God has a plan. Joseph got the chance to figure out or to experience what the answer for all of that distress was in his life. You and I may not. But God has a plan for you, for good, and for me, for good. That's why Joseph is kind of a hearkening of Jesus. Was it religious jealousy that killed Jesus? Yeah. Uh, ethnic oppression? Yeah. Political intrigue? Yeah. Was it the hand of his betraying friends? Yeah. Was it religious tensions? Yeah. Was it the hand of Satan? Yeah. But through all of those hands and all of those insufficient little whys, there's a big why that stands out in the center, and that's Jesus saying, because I want to save you. Because I love you. Why? Just because. Just because. That's God's answer. Just because I love you. 
I would encourage myself as somebody who is terminally curious and you together with me. I would exhort us if, if we are going to be wise, we should avoid the trap of the wise. That the wise would avoid the wise. Center in on the one great why. Jesus loves you. And God has a plan. And you can rest in that. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you with our ignorance. We come before you with our questions and we lay them down at the foot of your cross. We don't understand you or what you do and we don't understand the things in our lives, but we lay our whys at your feet in the face of your great because. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodwill. We put our heartbeats and breaths back in front of you. And we offer ourselves without question. In your name, Lord, and to your glory. Amen. Please stand. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you. May the Lord put you as a glove on his hand and use you as a light in this world. May he deliver you from troubles. May he redeem all of those hurts and pains and whys that you have had. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord grant you peace. And God's people said, Amen. go in grace.